Assalamu alaikum. Indeed, <coughs> there are so many blessings of Almighty that we are eternally grateful. Today, the Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine has put together a new venture in which we are discussing the atherosclerotic diseases and all the effects that it causes to the body. I'm lucky that today, uh, by the way, I'm Professor Bilal Muhyiddin, uh, Head of Cardiology at um, AEMU and Mio Hospital. Today, uh, we are having uh, a satellite, a whole set of stars with us who will be discussing with you and uh, conveying and once again updating and doing the continuous medical education for you. I have Professor Tariq Wasim sitting right next to me and he'll be giving a talk and presentation on it. Professor Tariq Wasim is an eminent scholar and a teacher of mine and currently he's the professor of medicine in uh, in um, in Akhtar Sayyid Medical College. I've always associated him with KE uh, because of his long association with it. Uh, Professor Azizur Rahman uh, is in the panel with us today and a par excellence uh, teacher who has uh, been associated with teaching for so many years that probably even he has forgotten how many years he has been teaching everyone. I think he probably started teaching people when he was even a very young boy when he was teaching his, his, uh, his brothers at that time because etc so he's yeah, and now he's referred to as teachers of teachers of teachers and it's an immense uh, pleasure sir to have you over here currently he's the professor at, uh, in, of medicine at the Rashid Thief Hospital as the senior vice president of the Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine and he has um, uh, was the um, main person behind the services when he was associated with services um, uh, hospital and the services institute of medical sciences the uh, scientific journal coming out from there and it is that thing that he has brought over here and he's taking uh, he's the chief editor for the uh, society of Federal medicine and of course he is the chair steering committee of the hypertension uh, for the Pakistan society of Federal medicine I also have the privilege that with me from all the way from Fastabad, Professor Fizullah has kindly joined in. Abdul Fizullah has, has, sorry, sir, <laughs> has joined us from all the way from there. And uh, he, he, he's a par excellence also. Those of you who are associated with cardiology and medicine would know that um, he, he has got a fan uh, club of his own. And if you are in um, walking in Prestabad streets and you're not carrying money, you can only give him a call and he'll make sure that everything is taken care of you for you over there. So he's there with us. Uh, he's the uh, was a, formerly the vice president of Pakistan Cardiac Society, and he was formerly the president of the Pakistan Hypertension League. Those of you who are listening to me, please don't try it because I have done it, and he won't let anyone else do that. So etc. Professor Zubair, uh, um, the Chief of Cardiology from uh, Jinnah Hospital uh, is, uh, is with us. And uh, again, a big fan, uh, a male follows you, sir. Whether you know about it or not, that's a different thing. But uh, a teacher par excellence and uh, one who has taught and trained a lot of people in interventional medicine and uh, interventional cardiology. And uh, currently, he uh, looks after the examinations of the Pakistan um, uh, of the Pakistan ca cardiology being held uh, at CPSP. the CPSP. Um, we are also fortunate today to have Professor um, Fatma with us, Fatma, uh, Fatma Nadeem with us, uh, and she is going to bring a very new, pleasant change into so, this curriculum because finally we have got people from the community. Uh, of medicine, community medicine people with us. She was formerly the, uh, the professor of community medicine at LMDC and was the former head of um, uh, the sciences at the University of Health Sciences. She's uh, referred now as a public health specialist, one who basically define what needs to be done at, for the communities at large. Today, the panel discussions, after everyone else has had their short part, Dr. Professor Fatma, I'll be requesting you to put in and enlighten us with where the society is going wrong, especially, et cetera, and how we can sort of, you know, do something for the society at large. So without much ado, I think uh, the basic introductions have been carried out. And uh, we have, as it is, we are not to have not too much time at our disposal. So I'll request Professor Tariq Wasim Saab uh, to kindly uh, start off with this presentation about atherosclerosis and what it has done 
or what it is doing to us at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal, for the nice introduction. And uh, we are lucky to have uh, so much of, uh, uh, say, galaxy of physicians and uh, more of cardiologists. So, Zisa, me and uh, you are probably uh, <laughs> crossover <laughs> in between these. Right. So, uh, uh, my screen is shared now. Right. So, why we are going to do that? Because uh, there is a lot of increase in the both prevalence as well as uh, the presentation of uh, this atherosclerotic coronary disease in, in various forms. What we'll be doing today would be, uh, I'll be sharing with you the disease burden uh, internationally as well as locally. We'll talking about the mortality and morbidity associated with it. We'll talk about people at risk. We'll talk about knowing the risk of yourself as well as your patient's risk or uh, empowering patients to know their risk. And we'll also be uh, talking about uh, one of the uh, very popular online risk calculation tools. And then we'll be, of course, be talking about primary and secondary prevention strategies with the help of our uh, uh, other colleagues from cardiology department. And then, of course, the public health strategies to how to overcome all this. Now, we have a lot of uh, disease uh, all around. Uh, it's around almost 17 million people die of cardiovascular disease worldwide. And if we go on to this figure that what would be the future in uh, around 2030, this number would rise to around 23 million. So it's a lot of number. It's a lot of uh, people dying of this disease. And uh, we should be probably doing something for that. Sharing the local data, I got this data from one single center in the in the town, and I, I'm um, lucky to have uh, with the, on the panel today Bilal, who is uh, representing uh, cardiology from uh, Mio, Professor Zubair, who is representing Jina, and uh, Hafiz with a lot of experience from Faisalabad of decades uh, experience from Faisalabad. This is just one center uh, data and uh, you will be amazed at how much disease we have. And this is the end result that uh, so much of uh, this the patient load into all areas that you don't have even walking place there. This is uh, a scene of a very, um, uh, say, busy uh, emergency of uh, Punjab Institute of Cardiology. And uh, just uh, um, uh, I had this 2020 data from the MNC room uh, from one of my colleagues that uh, uh, right. right so on an average about 1000 patient daily present in er of uh, cardiology department uh, this pic out of them about 100 are admitted they are uh, admitting around approximately 3000 patients per month from the emergency department alone and a yearly number of admission is around 31 to 32000s and uh, the emergency cath lab procedures performed in the one single center in one, one city. We are not talking of the whole province. We are not talking of the whole Pakistan. This is uh, 7,791 uh, emergency cath lab procedures done in the year 2020 in uh, PIC. When you talk of the routine procedures, they performed some 18,000 procedures. And uh, if you talk of the cardiac surgeries, around 3,000 surgeries. Now, this much is the load. Uh, workload and the pressure we are having onto our uh, system and um, I, I think uh, Zubair would have be having the similar figures Bilal would have the same figures and probably and if we add the, the biggest uh, population area Karachi into it it probably would be further large so it's a large burden of disease but what we are getting it is the, the, the tip of this iceberg we are getting these patients when they have already manifest disease. We are not talking of that, but how much it is prevalent in the community. And that's what we, we do a lot of things uh, for these patients, but we do too little and too late, right? One half of the what has been achieved in cardiovascular mortality improvement worldwide. And uh, there has been definitely improvement in uh, both the outcomes, but that outcome has come from the access to the procedural interventions and to the technological advancements, right? Interventions, what they do, they allow your patient 
of course they handle the acute problem but they allow your patient to live and cope with further advanced atrial cardiovascular disease to live with heart failure to live with disability of a stroke and all that and this is another enormous burden we have so there has to be effort that we reduce the global burden of this disease and focus primarily on to the not on to the manifest disease or rather on to the prevention of those events the the history of this prevention starts from something around 1948 right when firmingham studies for the first time established the principle that there is a link between the risk factors and uh the future cardiovascular events and that demonstrated that managing uh, these risk factor would benefit we went on further there was a trial in uh, by the name of mr fit trial or uh, mr fit trial in 1982 where 12866 persons were uh, followed up for 7 years for a predefined end points of coronary heart disease myocardial infarction and uh, all cause death mortality and they were into two groups one who underwent a special intervention and the other who underwent is the usual care group and the composite uh, end result was that those who had multiple intervention for the risk factors they did better and had a better outcome as compared to and this was done through improved dietary and lifestyle practices pharmacological therapy as well as to prevent the major uh, uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors then came this famous uh, the physician health study 1989 where we started giving aspirin to everybody whether or not have a heart disease anyone before 40 plus would be given and we have uh, lived with it for almost three decades and now someone or some corners are challenging it that it probably was is wise or not or is, do we still need to give it to those who do not have any risk factors or there are risk factors who will be probably be discussing that in our coming sessions about aspirin and antiplatelets as well then came this era of 1994 statin era right and this uh, landmark study again for a study which established the role of uh, treating hyperlipidemia using statins and this was followed by an uninterrupted a stream of randomized control trials with the validated effectiveness statin and then of course we started giving this and then uh, in 2002 they had a follow up of this mr fit trial 20 years after randomized they were uh, i mean 27 years in fact from the randomization and uh, this proved that uh, the those who were uh, intervened for risk factor prevention uh, and uh, the active intervention for multiple risk factors they still carry to continue the benefits of uh, this uh, interventions what are those risk factors the traditional risk factors we all have been repeatedly repeatedly saying and say telling to our uh, say students and our patients and our diabetes smoking obesity inactivity hypertension dyslipidemia and now there are what we call as emerging and non traditional risk factors as well preterm delivery is a risk factor for women hypertensive disorder pregnancy or pregnancy due to hypertension is another risk factor for developing uh, say atherosclerotic disease in women in later ages gestational diabetes uh, is is now another uh, defined risk factors are to mean diseases breast cancer treatment depression they are all linked to atherosclerotic uh, risk being increased then there are risk enhancers right family history of premature atherosclerotic kidney disease chronic kidney disease metabolic syndrome we will be elaborating on that as well uh, preeclampsia i already mentioned inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis psoriasis hiv and then your look at the last line south asian ancestry uh we the south asian and uh, indo pak region people or subcontinent region have a different uh, set of uh, say vessels and different set of uh, say risk factors and different socio economic uh, setup so if we that make us already prone to have this disease at a very very younger age the lipid biomarkers like ldl of more than 160 or a persistently elevated triglycerides of 175 with good again a risk enhancer for acid disease then there are few newer things adding like highly selective crp of more than 2 or lipoprotein a level of more than 
और एपो बी लेवल ऑफ मोर देन वन थर्टी और एल्बम इन यूरिया वेदर डायबेटिक और नॉन डायबेटिक मेक यू रिस्क एंड अनदर वन एंकल ब्रेकल इंडेक्स विच इज अ वेरी सिंपल टूल ऑफ रिकॉर्डिंग ब्लड प्रेशर इन दी आर्म एंड इन दी uh and at the ankle and then knowing uh, the the ratio uh, would tell us that uh, how much vessels have been sclerosed that's uh, again uh, a risk enhancer and the diabetic uh, are at an additional uh, risk of that risk, duration of diabetes of more than 10 uh, years in type 2 and more than 20 years make you more at risk of ascvd as compared to that Albumin urea, whether as I already mentioned, diabetic or non-diabetic, uh, your EGFR of less than sixty make you at risk. Retinopathy, neuropathy, and ankle breaker index—they all make you at risk of having an additional uh, risk in a patient with diabetes. How much these risk factors add to it? If you have diabetes, you have an almost four times more increased risk of uh, getting this atherosclerotic disease or a cardiovascular event. If you smoke, it increases risk by two and a half times. If your every five year increment after the age of fifty increases your risk by one point six nine times. Hypertension, homocysteine, and total cholesterol—they are all which are the uh, independent risk factors for right. This brings us that. Uh, with the presence of these risk factors some people are at uh, an additional risk some are at minor risk some at more risk this is a study of around 28000 patients uh, who had had an event and then they were uh, say uh, so out of those 27000 uh, patient 2020 who had an event 53% they met the definition of very high risk factor risk group 26% had multiple risk factors and had multiple events already and 74% had a major uh, atherosclerotic event and multiple high risk conditions and as the the bar uh, lower down shows down that uh, having multiple risk factor make you at more at risk of developing uh, this events again and again and even for the first events as well and they don't come alone this there is we we are in a habit of buying one and getting one free from khadi and all that but uh, having a previous mi make you five to five, seven times more likely to have another mi three to four times more likely to have a stroke having a previous stroke makes you nine times more likely to have another stroke having two to three times more likely to have uh, an mi and if you have a peripheral artery disease you are more at risk of developing a stroke or an mi so this is that you have one and you will have another one coming or there is a, it's in the pipeline unless you do intervene and that would be probably what we call the secondary intervention after you have an event the situation in pakistan is further worsened by that we have an already a burden of a lot of communicable diseases and then this non communicable disease and if you <laughs> divide them almost more than 50% are now having non communicable disease and this is a survey um, uh, summary of survey from uh, different surveys that uh, 41% of pakistani population adult population is hypertensive 21% smoke 21% are obese 17.3% have a high cholesterol and 17% is the prevalence of diabetes in adult population now with this much of uh, risk factors being present you can understand that uh, what would be the outcome in term of atherosclerotic vascular disease now despite that uh, this presents in an alarming form and it is uh, very serious and everybody knows it and we also know that uh, the the country like ours like um, india pakistan bangladesh or south asia we have a say increased risk but prevention strategies are not that Uh, lined up and they are not being uh, uh, pursued as they has to be most patient at high risk of atherosclerotic disease with established heart disease remain either untreated or inappropriately treated lipid lowering and beta blocker medication uh, is utilized in less than 30 to 40% of established disease patient 
ACE inhibitors are used in less than 40% of the patient who need it. And 20% of the hypertensive patients are appropriately identified and treated. And aspirin is used in approximately 50% of patients who are eligible by currently accepted indications. Now, a word about this atherosclerosis and what is uh, it's all about, what we are talking about. It's an atheroma or atheromatous plaque, uh, which is an accumulation of lipid uh, and uh, it's hardening of the vessels and this plaque, uh, which contains uh, debris, calcium and variable amounts of, and which leads on to narrowing of that vessels. It involves plenty of other factors as well. There are inflammatory pathways, there are proliferative pathways, there are thrombotic pathways. And these all are triggered in response to activation of the endothelium. The inflammatory markers like CRP, myeloprotic per peroxidase, they play a role. Fibrinogen and uh, plasminogen antigen, uh, antigen act, uh, in activation in a better uh, plays into the coagulation pathway. Nitrous oxide and antioxidants. Now, these are all factors which, uh, which do play their role in either generation of the atheroma or this atheroma getting uh, further uh, complicated at different uh, say stages. Now, it does not start happening in a day. We are born with some genetic makeup and have prone to develop, uh, say, right? And even genes can be rewritten. We are, we'll, we are now talking of uh, things called gene editing as well as gene being modified by behavior, by physical activity and all that. Even if you are prone to have disease, you are likely to alter the outcome. So we have to start this process starts very earlier on uh, as fatty streaks and you are genetically born to maybe have it. But this hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia, diabetes, family history, as we already elaborated, or the enhancing factors, they keep on enhancing it. And finally, the progression leads on to a day when this atheroma gets some, uh, say, insult by other many other factors. And that is the day when your patient end up in unstable angina, MI, or a stroke. So patient may be in an asymptomatic stage, patient may have some symptoms or patient may have an acute events developing acutely in the form of stroke. And that's probably the, the more common presentation uh, into, in, say, to the hospitals and to the physicians rather than patient reporting very earlier on or the physicians who are looking after them paying attention to those factors at an earlier stage as well. As I said, they would manifest as TIA or ischemia or myocardial infarction or as acute coronary syndromes. They may come up with renovascular hypertension. Erectile dysfunction is again one of the manifestations of atherosclerotic disease and maybe we can sensitize people to this by mentioning, mentioning that if you look after, I mean, because a lot of people are more concerned about that, claudication and limb ischemia. Now, these are all the manifestations which uh, uh, bring patient to on one day in the emergency room or where, whereas at that time, it's as I said, it's too, too little, too late. So we need to know the risk. There are multiple uh, risk uh, estimation tools available online, on the web, as well as in the, on your mobiles and WhatsApp. Uh, and with everybody having this, uh, in the, this, this digital age with this mobile technology, we can uh, say empower our patients to know their risk rather than any uh, further uh, say physician's consultation required. Now, this tool which we are be discussing would be Framingham scoring uh, based on that Framingham study and right. And uh, this uh, is to be used for people who do not have atherosclerotic coin, but this is not for the people who have already had an MI or a stroke or anything. This is for the people who are asymptomatic and who just want to know the risk before it happens. And all you need is that uh, you need to have uh, enter this, uh, the gender and your ethnicity. And for that, they have just made it white and African. 
and uh, by the way we pakistanis are uh, by our uh, our that are caucasians and we would have to add that uh, and uh, enter uh, this and uh, not that this we will be great okay so then we have to enter their systolic blood pressure diastolic blood pressure total cholesterol hdl ldl and of course enter the history of diabetes whether you are diabetic or not and then whether you are smoker or not whether you are on treatment for hypertension whether you are using statin or not or are you are on aspirin therapy and this simple entry of these figures would give you a score and would give you and of course if you are you are following this patient up you can probably add the previous data from the previous as well and that will get it how much change that has occurred now this simple tool can possibly be utilized by patient themselves because many of them do have all these uh, figures many a times calculated for uh, with them uh, from the labs or the physician coming uh, and having an encounter with the patient can probably ask him to get this uh, done what does it translates into that after this risk scoring if your risk you can be low risk patient if this score chances of having a first event in next 10 year is less than 10% if you have a risk of having event of 10 to 20% you will be labeled in intermediate risk group and if you are having a risk of more than 20% you would be classified as in a high risk group now the american college of cardiology or american heart association 2019 guidelines for prevention they say that if you are 40 to 75 year of age the clinician should routinely assess the traditional cardiovascular risk factors and calculate 10 year risk of ascvd using the pooled cohort equations that's what firmingham data is and uh, we should first calculate the risk for those 20 to 39 year of age it is reasonable to assess traditional risk factors and they probably need to be repeated every 4 to 6 years those who are at the borderline or uh, with the risk between 5 to 7.5% or who are intermediate risk 7.2 to, to, to less than 20% it is reasonable to use additional risk enhancers we mentioned few other risk factors or non traditional we will be discussing in probably uh, later on that what are those further factors to be looked after and you may have to be considering therapies as well in adults with an intermediate risk which is between 7.5 more than 7.5 but less than 20% or some selected individuals with the borderline risk between 5 to 7% if risk based decisions for preventive intervention is considered like statin therapy it remains uncertain that whether they should be prescribed or not but in this group if you are um, the, there are other risk enhancer present there is a recommendation that you can probably go for a coronary artery calcium scoring which may not be very feasible in our setup because we don't have much of this uh, um, say ct angiography on uh, ct available uh, at routinely costly so we probably have to go on to the the, the other factors more those uh, 20 to 39 year of age and uh, between or uh, between 40 and who have a less than 7.5 10% is we probably go to an, a further modification of the tool which then give you a lifetime risk or 30 year risk of uh, uh, having this event and uh, based on that your preventive or uh, in therapeutic strategies should be made on that basis yes cvd is preventable we know that uh, atherogenic lipoprotein caused it we know that risk exposure is universal and pervasive we know that it is common multifactorial treatable preventable so we need to have a holistic approach to risk assessment to detect and to treat the disease well before it becomes clinically apparent or it strikes you with a stroke or with an mi or something there have been made advances made and uh, there have been advances in epidemiology there has been basic sciences genetic risk assessment cardiovascular imaging therapeutics and they have uh, paid their dividend as well we have uh, some uh, dent made into the this um, say high prevalence but still a lead 
uh, a lot need to be done. Now, this preventive provider of the future would need training in expertise beyond what is we are currently delivering. What's prevention? Prevention is uh, a design, an activity designed to protect patients or other members of the public, patient as well as the other member of the public from actual or potential health threats and their harmful consequences. Or you may say that prevention is the action aimed at eradicating, eliminating or minimizing the impact of disease and disability. And this brings us to this, uh, the, what we call as a pyramid, that there's a primordial prevention, there's a primary prevention, there is a secondary prevention and there's a tertiary prevention. So the primary primordial prevention basically is maintaining good health and avoiding the risk. Primary prevention is that you have to reduce and eliminate the risk and avoid clinical disease events. And then we have to minimize the severity of clinical events and reduce the likelihood of repeat events. That would be secondary prevention. And then, of course, minimize the impact of chronic and uh, clinical illness. So the last portion, which where where we most of our funds goes, is secondary and tertiary portion. That we are into surgeries, devices, rehabilitation, diagnosis. But the major bulk of the diseases in the primary and 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 more, more main benefit can probably be achieved there rather than investing right so who does it so who are the movers and shakers of uh, this state with its responsibility state to uh, probably provide the environment and right where school teachers and parents and peer groups can uh, play their role in uh, say promoting good health and healthy activities we need to have a liaison with the food authorities and public health department to for, offer customizable menus for uh, uh, good healthy diets. We have to involve family physicians uh, for early detection and identification of the risk indicators and plan intervention in lifestyle medications. We have to combine the efforts by involving internists, diabetologists, cardiologists, uh, smoking session programs to diagnose correctly and set realistic goals to follow them up. Who does it? Right? The action to halt the process disease in its incipient stage in order. So we have to have management of diabetes, hypertension, heart failure due to ischemic cardiomyopathy, dyslipidemias, whether it is to be done by interventional cardiologists, by cardiac surgeons, internist, family physician, or all of them, probably all of them. And we probably have to define that who does what stage and how does it goes on. It has to be a team-based approach. We have to involve the, the look into psychosocial, economic, and cultural aspect of it. We have to improve health literacy. We have to um, have food access to healthy foods. Uh, environment needs to be improved and of course this sleep quality and family and session support they all are needed if we want to have and some impact on reduction of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, say outcomes so we have to come together it is local authorities we promote population lifestyle programs raise public awareness promote and improve uptake general practitioner who would be embed in regular blood pressure monitoring and diabetic uh, screening and of course uh, prioritize the local early detection and treatment and management and uh, of course the right care uh, CVD prevention program, pharmacist and pharma pharmaceuticals uh, with the, which offer opportunities like uh, someone visiting a pharmacy and we have a big large chain pharmacies if you can ma make counters for a uh, regular blood pressure checkup out there or regular blood sugar checkup there maybe sponsored by um, a state or maybe by the, some pharmaceuticals that can be a very very useful tool we support healthy activities we uh, of course uh, regular checkups as well and of course, then the community setting that uh, what uh, can be done. Do we have uh, enough uh, space for walk or uh, say exercise and all that? So this all uh, probably has to be combined 
to make an impact rather than just making on large uh, five star or big hospitals and uh, the uh, assembling all the interventional things uh, probably it would be it has to start right at the bottom now this is where uh, brings me to the <laughs> preventive cardiology section that this is a of course a developing specialty it has already developed uh, elsewhere and is emerging from the background of already established services we have services for uh, the lipid clinics and diabetes clinic and hypertension clinic and general cardiology clinic but there is a need to establish this preventive cardiology it's uh, incumbent cardiology community to invest in cardiovascular prevention because past gains are what we have achieved is threatened by the bulk of the disease again. So now is the time to establish the dedicated preventive cardiology services. There is call for action. Accessory cardiovascular disease remains the leading killer in the world. We all know it's largely preventable. The need is, uh, there is a need to dedicate significant resources uh, to prevention of atherosclerotic disease uh, in the clinical settings and uh, preventive cardiology is a discipline worthy of attaining subspecialty status. Uh, I hope that both uh, all my cardiologist colleagues like it and that's what all I have to say. Uh, I hope that I was in time. So this is uh, what uh, we want to that uh, where to start with. We, we will have been uh, having the panel discussion and Thank you very much for Thank your you. patient listening. Thank you, Tariq Wasim, sir. Indeed, this is a, a subject which is uh, extremely close to all of us and extremely important. Something which is extremely difficult to do. But as you, in your own uh, statement, very kindly said that uh, it is not just the primary and the major risk factors that are there. There are a lot of currently minor risk factors which are also an equally strong uh, promoters of disease. We have, had, we have been having these questions in between. There was a question about uh, getting uh, radiation exposures and how these radiations can uh, lead to the problems. And uh, the idea is that if you are getting exposed to uh, radiation treatments, you are actually also getting into an inflammatory stage and that can all lead into these things. But uh, I'd like to now get down to our panelists. And uh, Professor Zizerman, my first uh, debate or the question is, uh, goes to where uh, Tariq Saab left it off. And that was basically the non-traditional risk factors. And along with it, please also touch on the metabolic syndromes, which are the way we, it is said that we are a metabolic syndrome heaven for people. Over here. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, let me first thank Professor Bilal Mohyuddin for a very generous introduction. And I must compliment our first speaker, debut speaker, Professor Tariq Wasim, who is the host director and the force behind this course. He made a wonderful debut presentation. So I think the start of this course is very good. And it was very heartened to see that at one time, I think 275 people were online. So coming to your the question, I think he talked about the major risk factors and he also touched upon the small, relatively novel or new risk factors. Uh, I think we all know. We all know, and but it is the time to do something now. Uh, talking about this metabolic syndrome, the concept is basically, I think it's a very, very complex concept. Some people would even deny the very existence of this syndrome. They say it's just coincidental uh, collection of certain things. Other would say that it has got a specific phenotype, a specific genotype, a specific pathophysiology, a syndrome in itself. It has got actually an ICD-9 classification so it is recognized worldwide as a medical condition what is it i think i will give you the simplistic way, uh, view because simplicity is in my gene <laughs> and it is basically i think overeating it is positive energy balance so if we eat more than what our body needs we tend to put on weight and that weight may be uniform or that fat may be accumulated around the waist 
So if fat is accumulated around the waist in the viscera, that is what is more harmful because that is metabolically active. If you uh, search the literature, you will find, I think, at least five or six definitions of metabolic syndrome. All societies have given their own uh, definitions. So if you have six definitions, at least five of them are wrong. Hmm. So there is no consensus. But they all agree on the basic concept, basic components of metabolic syndrome. I think the most essential component is the visceral obesity. And visceral obesity, this BMI is not actually a very correct measure of visceral obesity. Simplistic way of measuring visceral obesity is the waist. And the worldwide accepted criteria is for, for men, waist of 40 inches, and for women, waist of 35 inches is the criteria for uh, uh, fulfilling the visceral obesity. Now remember, this is not the waist which your tailor knows. This is the waist at the umbilicus. This is almost three inches more than your waistline. Okay, so you have to measure it when patient is standing comfortably without pulling his tummy in, just as a surprise measure the tummy side at the large level. So 40 for men and 35 for women, if more than that, you fulfill one criteria. More elaborate criteria would be if you go for CT scan and if you see the visceral fat, fat in the liver, fat in the pancreas, then of course it will define the visceral obesity more. And second is high blood pressure. Now blood pressure, I say just high blood pressure, not necessarily in the range of hypertension. Blood pressure higher than normal. Similarly, high glucose, not necessarily where would you call somebody a diabetic, more than normal glucose, and high triglyceride, not again at a level where would you like to intervene with phenofibrates. So anything which is more than desirable, uh, and HDL, HDL, you know, uh, in our part of the world, we tend to have low HDL. If you are a man and your HDL is less than uh, 40, and if you're a woman, your HDL is less than 50, then again, you fulfill the criteria. Some authority says that one essential criteria is visceral obesity and three other, uh, two other, but others say any three criteria. So I think basically all it means is that you are overfed person and you are not doing excess, uh, enough exercise. So this is metabolic syndrome and it predisposes to insulin resistance and then ultimate diabetes and obesity. Now, many people debate whether insulin resistance comes first, that causes obesity, or obesity comes first and that causes insulin resistance. But both actually aggravate each other. So ultimately, we end up with this syndrome and then that is the one major risk factor for uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The minor ones, like there are many novel uh, the risk factors have been identified. Anything which reflects this metabolic syndrome or anything which reflects inflammatory state, like C-reactive protein, like interleukin-6, like fibrinogen level, like PAI, I think anything, even TLC count has been linked with this uh, metabolic syndrome. So anything which, uh, which reflects inflammation can also be considered a risk factor. First, we have to uh, address the major homocysteine and other risk factors. So first we have to address the major risk factors and I think only then we should go for the minor risk factors because we have to make best use of our limited resources. So if you can take care of the major resources, major risk factors, I think the minor one can be taken up later. So and this is a lifelong approach. It's not just one time. Every person has to take care of his risk factors and then can hope that he will be, uh, he can prevent his coronary arteries. Remember one thing, this is quantitative. Now, if you cannot bring down your weight to an ideal level, you have not missed a train or a flight. You have still done something. So do something. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, indeed, uh a situation where so much needs more to be done. 
and so much more needs to be thought about how we can uh, do the help uh, the correct things for our society at large and how we can help our own health but uh, today luckily at this very moment there are about 300 viewers sitting with us professor abdul afiz sir um firstly apologies for my uh, earlier mistake no, no, it's okay. and uh, but those of you who are from uh, not from lahore they know him of course and of course everyone knows you who has who's a follower of cardiology and of medicine for that matter you are there everywhere uh one thing that is happening these days is a rampant of the people want to get investigated and of course everyone has a right to get investigated and especially those who are yet not asymptomatic who are asymptomatic people but they want to know how things are for them and we have got this whole set of various investigations going on whether you have ascvd or not or whether you are suffering from something so could you kindly shed some light on the non uh, for people who are not uh, symptomatic but must be investigated high risk patients thank you very much for your kind invitation it was a player listening to professor wasim <clears throat> who nicely highlighted uh, the uh, low risk groups and the intermediate risk group and the high risk group on the basis of the firmingham risk score i think it's very important information uh, how this uh, we can apply in our clinical practice that is the most important part <clears throat> i think uh, if the risk score is less than 5 very simple i will advise my a uh, patient to exercise maintain body weight and good eating habit avoid fat and uh, take vegetable and fruits and avoid smoking that is the simple which i will write to that my patient that's it uh the patient who has a high risk is more than uh, 20 uh, uh risk factor more than 20% i think he needs status uh the most important group of people who are 80% of the population they are intermediate risk uh, population and uh, they are to be dealt with quite cleverly i think in this group of patients there is there are risk factors and they are in the intermediate groups and uh, there is sub clinical inflammation going on in their vessels and we have to know whether these people have some silent atheromas in their circulations which are not producing symptoms this is very important now you may not agree with me i hope you agree with me i am giving you evidence on the basis of class 2 b recommendations of uh, european society of cardiology guideline and the level of evidence is b so first thing which i will do with this uh, intermediate group patients will be i will perform exercise i i will be cost effective number 1 is very important i will be cost effective i will subject my patient to stress testing number 1 why stress testing suppose he has a sedentary habits you no know, he want to go to some exercise program so sh i should know what happens to his ecg while he's performing uh, the stress testing the other thing is that i will pick up group of people who do not achieve uh, target heart rate or who have a poor exercise capacity these group of people they were followed for 5 to 6 years in seattle heart study and the incidence of events was quite high in the intermediate groups exercise testing uh, failure to achieve the target heart rate so i will advise exercise that the evidence is to a uh, indications the second test uh, which nicely highlights is the ankle radius single is very cheap where blood pressure in the lower limb and the upper limb and the ratio is 0.9 your patient has probably 50% occlusion of one of the vessels and mind you 80% of the patients 
these patients have got a mild atheroma or 50% atheroma will not present to you with the, the intermediate claudication. So forget intermediate claudication when the intermediate claudications appears, the disease is very severe. So for primary prevention, you have to perform ankle bracket index and pick up those patients. Uh, I think uh, Bilal was talking very much against uh, CT NGO and also the same also that is very expensive. It's not very expensive. I tell you, you send your patient for calcium scoring. That's it. Takes uh, 10 minutes and minimum radiation. You will pick up two things. Positive calcium score, give them statins. Negative calcium score, the patient has multiple risk factors. He is not free of risk. Very important. Keep in mind, if the score is negative, your patient is not safe. He may develop atheroma. He may develop myocardial infarction. So the positive score will give you a very important information. But negative score doesn't mean that your patient is very safe. If it has got familial hyperglycerolemia, he may develop a coronary plaque in the I am not recommending coronary CT angiogram. It's absolutely not indicated in asymptomatic patient. This test is for symptomatic patients with coronary disease. Symptomatic. So asymptomatic calcium scoring, again, very important. Studies are available and follow-up shows that statins help in those patients. MRI in experimental stages, not recommended in these patients. However, uh, in experimental studies, in, uh, it has shown that it nicely differentiate between different types of atheromas, calcified atheromas, flat pitch atheroma. Maybe in future, we'll be performing uh, the MRIs, maybe after five, five years, 10 years. In this meeting, we'll be discussing MRI in our patient properly. We don't know. But another important information which I left is intima media thickness. Very simple. Just put your uh, probe here and see the carotid. And if you find uh, the intermediate thickness 1.5 or 50% uh, narrowing, look at the plaque is soft or irregular. The chances of stroke are high. In these intermediate group patients, I will perform all these five investigations, which are according to the guidelines of the latest guidelines, European Society of Cardiology. To a level of evidence B. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, extremely eloquently and clearly defined, especially regarding the fact that uh, these days this epidemic of the desire of getting a CT scan is concerned, and we keep on uh, discussing this factor at all our various scientific uh, places. Uh, Professor Zubair, uh, next uh, one on the line will be you. Um, there are questions coming in regarding Mike. the genetic screening, the Mike. desire for or the need for it, Mike. and also uh, Mike on me, and also about the fact that uh, those people who have been unfortunate to get the disease and have got the whole thing going on, apart from drugs, etc., how do you think that their secondary prevention should happen? And in this set of individuals who have had a sec who have had an issue, what about their family? How would you like to help their family? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, thank you, Bilal, for inviting me uh, to address this service gathering and a uh, wonderful presentation, Dr. Tarek, and uh, my experts sitting on my both sides. You know, uh, Dr. Tarek was talking about framing and score, and obviously it was an uh, asymptomatic cardiac individual, you know, asymptomatic individual, rather. And what I have been asked is to talk, and what he was talking about was primary prevention before the patient gets any uh, ischemic episode or whatsoever, or manifestation of a atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. What I have been asked is regarding the secondary prevention. The secondary prevention obviously means if the patient has a manifested atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it may range from stable angina to unstable angina, non-STEMI, or full-blooded, you know, uh, STEMI. And uh, obviously, later on, sequelae like heart failure, which is one of the most common, you know, situations which can encounter. I'll divide uh, the secondary prevention, obviously, in various parts. First of all, all the risk factors which Tariq Sab told 
in the primary prevention hold very true for secondary prevention as well. Obviously, these were the risk factors which brought the patient to you, which made the patient sick of uh, this atherosclerotic heart disease. First of all, smoking. Obviously, as he told, you know, it's about 25 to 30% worldwide smoking. 20s, you know, it's the same figures here. And the worst thing is that uh, younger age group is getting these uh, things, you know, uh, smoking, especially in the form of shisha smoking. We are getting so many young patients, you know, as compared to, you know, when we were doing house job, we really would see, I, I hope the, all the experts will believe, any individual coming to us with ischemic heart disease who was less than 50 years of age. Mostly, you know, majority 90% plus were above 50. Now what we are seeing is that we are seeing the patients in 30s and 40s and the 40s being the peak age. The other worst thing which we are noticing is that initially, you know, about 30, 40 years ago, this ischemic heart disease used to be a disease of the rich. Now it has gone. Rich people, you know, they have started uh, looking after themselves. Now it's, it's become the disease of the poor. And the worst thing that could happen to poor people is one of the factors is smoking. So you have to stop smoking and even shisha smoking for younger age group. The second is the blood pressure control, obviously at primary prevention level, as well as the secondary prevention level, obviously the blood pressure needs to be controlled. And the guidelines now show the blood pressure ideally should be AHA recommendations 120 by 80 diastolic. Initially, you know, we'd say 140 by 90, but now the recommendations say even the diastolic blood pressure for 80 to 90 does matter and reducing it from even 85 to 80 will definitely reduce the mortality. And the maximum limit nowadays, they say is 130 by 80 is the ultimate uh, level which uh, can be tolerated, obviously, with lifestyle modifications or otherwise. Third risk factor is your diabetes. Obviously, the diabetics, uh, uh, the consultants are sitting on my right side and the left side as well. And uh, what we know from different studies that HbA1c is one of the most important indicator and uh, it should be less than seven. And that is the target which we aim at while we control the diabetes. Regarding cholesterol, high cholesterol level, obviously, I'll be coming to the drugs also. First of all, I'm just mentioning the targets, you know. Regarding cholesterol, obviously, uh, you have to go for total uh, lipid profile, not just the cholesterol. And you should be looking specifically at your LDL cholesterol levels. For an ischemic documented case, whether it's a stable ischemic heart disease or unstable, the lower is better is the theory. It should be less than LDL should be less than 100 and ideally 50 to 70 milligram percent. Then obviously the sedentary lifestyle should not be there. One should be walking at least 30 minutes per day, brisk walk for five days a week. Then finally, obesity is one of the risk factors for ischemic heart disease as well as the metabolic syndrome. As uh, Aziza was telling, obviously the waist should be for less than 40 for males and less than 35 for females and lower the better. Obviously, with a waste of 35 for males, obviously the risk factor gets even lower. So that is regarding the targets which we have to go for and we should be uh, very cautious about that. How to achieve these targets? Obviously, you know, regarding now I come to the secondary prevention, the medical part of the secondary prevention. What sort of medicines the patient has to be on for secondary prevention. First of all, antiplatelet therapy. For stable angina, obviously aspirin is the cyclooxygenase inhibitor. For stable angina, it has to be lifelong. That is 75 to 150 milligram daily lifelong. And for unstable angina patients, non-STEMI or STEMI or patients with stents, you know, it has to be at least for one year for unstable patients. And, uh, you know, for... Uh, this uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy then the other drug which comes in that is the, the theropyridines or ticagrelor so when you come for unstable and this uh, acute cordy syndrome situations it should not be just aspirin it should be a dual antiplatelet therapy that is combination of aspirin with either of the theropyridines or ticagrelor and i have already told you that at least 
वन ईयर फॉर स्टेमी और नॉन स्टेमी रिसेंट स्टडीज विथ टिकॉक्लेडोर हैव शोन दैट फॉर फर्स्ट ईयर टू गिव टिकॉक्लेडोर स्पेशली पोस्ट टेंटिंग नाइनटी मिलीग्राम बी डी and after one year to two years it may be reduced to 60 mg bd and it will have added effects the third important drug to be given are the statins obviously these are the stabilizers for plaques plaques you know because of their enzymatic effects and the statin to look for in a case of ischemic heart disease documented whether stable or unstable are high intensity statins and only two statins are recommended one is rosuvastatin and other one is atovastatin and for rosuvastatin the dose has to be between 20 to 40 mg of rosuvastatin per day and for atovastatin it has to be uh, 40 to 80 mg per day that is the mandatory dose to be looked after then coming up to the role of ace inhibitors ace inhibitors they are mandatory drug for secondary prevention because of their ability to improve the endothelial dysfunction and the hope trial that was done in 90s late 90s proved it beyond doubt that obviously because of this uh, uh, endothelial dysfunction prevention they are the drugs to be given especially for high risk individuals and then europa trial it showed for low risk individual also and if the patient is suffering from lv dysfunction along with this ischemic heart disease then obviously other than this first of all if the patient is not tolerant to ace inhibitor then you get on to arb and for lv dysfunction if the patient has got ejection fraction less than 35 obviously the arni is the first line treatment now recommended and you can switch on straight away from arb to arni if required and for this uh, uh, ace inhibitor you have to wait at least for 36 hours for switching on then the diabetic control should be marvelous and obviously uh, there are different sort of drugs you know the ultimate aim is to reduce uh, this uh, hba1c to 7 and latest you know this empagliflozin obviously this is one of the drug which is shown to be of benefit if you have got ejection fractions less than 35 or 40 mg percent so that is the second part and the third part is risk factor modification and whether you want to continue with this conservative approach or interventional approach or aggressive approach you know most of the people would say why should we go with the stenting why not medicine so obviously if the patient is stable stable coronary artery disease obviously you don't just rely on getting him just uh, the drugs let's say the patient is suffering from stable angina you have to risk stratify the patient if the patient is above 65 if the patient is smoker if the patient is diabetic if the patient has uh, obesity obviously then you must subject him to some sort of a risk stratification and the best risk stratification strategy is radiolytic scanning or the thelium scan which we do if there is on thelium stress if there are multiple areas of severe ischemia or if there is lv dysfunction appearing or lung intake increasing then obviously this stable angina patient has also to go for a interventional therapy otherwise he remains on medical therapy and they do very well as shown in karish trial but for unstable angina acute coronary syndrome stemi obviously you have to move to interventional approach there is no way then you you just leave it for medical management and for interventional approach obviously for stemi obviously you just go at with the earlier the better the primary psci is the therapy of choice and for unstable angina obviously the earlier the better the angiography and obviously then if you go with aggressive or interventional approach then obviously the thing comes whether to go for stenting or whether to go for a bypass then there are specific you know indications to go for a bypass when it's a left main or a triple vessel disease highly calcified vessels and lv dysfunction in a diabetics especially you know the bypass is a preferable choice and especially if the lien is involving left vein and the osteoproximal led but if the uh, you we use a syntax score you know uh, for the cardiologist and if the syntax depending upon the different anatomical you know figures uh, uh, you can look at the net and if it's between you know uh, 22 to uh, less than 22 it's a mild uh, uh, low syntax score it, uh, it it is a case for intervention 22 to 32 it's intermediate it can go either way 
and above 32 it's surgery so you know ultimately once we have put in the stents or whether we have gotten for bypass obviously the lifestyle modification the dietary uh, modifications the treatment you know the ace the statins uh, you know they have to go lifelong along with aspirin last uh, comment for regarding the family screening you know you talked about bilal obviously you know uh, it varies except uh, what we are talking most of about is the modifiable risk factors you know and with uh, you know doing something for modifiable risk factor you can get on and you can improve and but in the cases where the disease runs in family obviously they should be screened at an early age obviously there is family history of diabetes hypertension as you know most of the people are unaware that they are suffering from diabetes hypertension they should be screened early in their life for cholesterol for diabetes hypertension and obviously if it's running in the family everything may be just very okay but obviously they should be encouraged to indulge themselves in a healthy lifestyle so that they don't own the other modifiable risk factors and to prevent the cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. You have really made a big effort of putting so many things so eloquently in, in, a, in a sort of small time. Even you have touched the syntax go. <laughs> now, except you'll be amazed to uh, know that your talk has been received extremely well. Mm -hmm. Because people have already started hitting the Framingham risk factor scoring over there, and they have realized that uh, those who are above the age of 40, mm -hmm. the automatic calculator does not do the trick. Mm -hmm. So, for those who are doing that, the automatic calculator put your age as 40. Otherwise, uh, you can do it on a manual uh, basis yeah. uh, in which you can then get the proper calculation done. Because only the age part that is left is it is not much of a difference as far as the age after the real effect comes after the age of 40 in both males and females another thing uh, from uh, about the risk factor management center was about your lifestyle modification that we have all been talking about and uh, those of you who are into it would be keen to learn that uh, about a pound of fat that is to say one kg of fat or a pound of fat, pound of fat carries 3,500 calories if you want to get rid of it. So if you want to get rid of one kg of fat from your body, you need to burn 7,700 calories. If you do 30 minutes of brisk walk, 30 minutes of brisk walk in which you cover at least three kilometers, you will probably burn about 150 calories. So 150 calories, now understand what effect this means. So the real trick is not in burning, but in consuming less. So you need to control. Exercise will make you smart, will make you look 35 inches based less, even if you are not. But if you want to get rid of that extra weight, do not consume it. And you know, it is this extra weight, Dr. Professor Fatma, that we are always talking about. And there are perspective and strategies that we need to take in order to cut down on this AS ASCVD. Would you please be so kind as to shed some light on this ASCVD, how to, what strategies we need to take? Thank you, uh, Professor Bilal. Um, when, of course, being a public health specialist, I'm, I will be talking about uh, strategies from a public health uh, perspective. And um, uh, there are uh, two broad uh, strategies that I will be uh, talking about. One is the uh, population or the mass uh, strategy, and the other is the high risk strategy uh, for the uh, primary prevention of uh, ASCVD. Now, uh, the population or the mass strategy uh, has to uh, do with decreasing the prevention uh, or controlling the risk factors or determinants of cardiovascular disease in the entire population. However, when we uh, talk about the high risk strategy, we identify individuals who are at high risk of developing uh, CVD and we uh, bring them into the uh, healthcare system and provide them, manage them and treat them effectively, but at the level of the individual. 
uh, uh, my uh, expert uh, colleagues here have already uh, highlighted on the key modifiable risk factors of uh, a coronary vascular disease. Uh, and we all know the major ones are uh, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, smoking, lack of physical activity, hyperlipidemia, uh, uh, taking unhealthy diets and all. So the uh, population or the mass strategy aims at addressing these key modifiable risk factors at the level of the population through uh, mass uh, education, through environmental modification, through uh, uh, nutritional interventions, uh, and uh, through a lot of uh, policy initiatives also. When we look up, uh, when we talk about uh, health education uh, from a public health and pop, uh, mass uh, population uh, strategy, uh, we uh, need to involve the mass media, we need to involve educational institutions, we need to uh, involve community leaders, we need to in, uh, involve opinion leaders who can educate the public, increase their awareness regarding the uh, benefits of exercise, uh, regarding the uh, uh, disadvantages of consumption unhealthy diet, the uh, detrimental uh, effects that smoking has on human health. So all that component needs to be addressed through health education. When we uh, talk about uh, physical activity and nutritional intervention, I think uh, schools have a very important role to play. Uh, uh, a lot of schools here are uh, have been opened up in small localities. They do not have play areas. Uh, they should uh, not allow children to eat junk food. So, you know, such uh, um, uh, initiatives at the level of the school can uh, promote or diminish uh, unhealthy uh, lifestyle and promote healthy lifestyle, which eventually has an effect on uh, cardiovascular disease incidence and prevalence. Similarly, when we talk about environmental modification, and of course, we all know when we talk about consumption of a healthy diet, we promote uh, uh, the use uh, of consumption of vegetables and fruits, uh, decrease uh, fat, fats and saturated fats in one's diet and uh, salt not more than five grams per day, according to the World Health Organization. So if, if you want the general public to consume fruits and vegetables, then the government needs to subsidize these foods for the general public. How many can afford having fruits and vegetables on a daily basis? Is. This is something which uh, has uh, uh, needs to come from the top down uh, uh, the uh, initiative from the government. Uh, when we talk about there should be uh, to promote physical activity, there should be parks in every community. Uh, there should be uh, easy, uh, pedestrians uh, should be uh, easily allowed to move about rights of pedestrians on the road. Uh, if you look at uh, Europe and the uh, developed world, there are uh, lanes for bicycles, which encourages people to leave their cars at home and commute even to work on bicycles. So, you know, these are all uh, 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 things which need to be uh, addressed by the government. These are policy initiatives which uh, will uh, promote the uptake of uh, healthy lifestyle and behavioral change, promoting cardiovascular uh, health. And uh, as uh, pointed out by uh, Professor uh, Tariq, he mentioned the MRFIT, the Multiple uh, Risk Factor Intervention Trial. Similarly, we have the Stanford Three Community uh, Trial. We have the North Carolina uh, Trial, which took place in Finland. And they have all emphasized on, uh, uh, you know, if you educate uh, and uh, uh, provide awareness to the general public, regarding the uh, benefits of uh, adopting a healthy lifestyle and the detriments of uh, having a un, uh, consuming unhealthy diet or lack of exercise, uh, being obese or smoking, it all had a positive impact over two to five to seven years on the incidence of cardiovascular disease. So this has been established by evidence. So this all comes under the uh, uh, umbrella of the population or mass strategy. Uh, if we look, up, look at the high risk strategy, uh, where you identify individuals who are at high risk of developing uh, CVD, a uh, use of various risk calculators, then uh, you, uh, in my opinion, you're leaving out those individuals who have low or moderate risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. And and evidence has shown that these individuals uh, 
uh, uh, add uh, to a large proportion of those who eventually may or do develop cardiovascular disease. So uh, I would say that we need to have a comprehensive two-tiered uh, approach in which we utilize the population mass strategy uh, in addition to the high-risk strategy if we want to uh, address the rising burden of uh, cardiovascular disease in our country. And here I would also like to tell uh, all participants that in Pakistan, uh, we uh, the, the burden of non-communicable diseases is approximately 54%. Mm -hmm. And of that, the proportionate mortality uh, contributed by uh, CV Ds is approximately 24%, mm -hmm. which is huge. And um, uh, I uh, would say that it's important to remember that uh, genes uh, load the gun and it is the environment, the lifestyle, and it is our behavioral factors which pull the trigger. So even if we have genes, if we have family history of heart disease or diabetes, we can delay the onset of coronary uh, vascular disease by adopting a healthy lifestyle, by exercising daily, by eating a, a healthy diet, uh, and uh, uh, not smoking, not uh, consuming alcohol, etc., which are the modifiable risk factors. Uh, here also, uh, just a few um, a moment I would take to emphasize on primordial prevention, uh, which was mentioned by Professor Tariq. Now, primordial prevention aims to uh, prevent the emergence of risk factors. And uh, we all know that chronic diseases, similarly cardiovascular disease, has its origin in early childhood. So it is important that we encourage our children to adopt a healthy lifestyle. Please encourage them uh, not to consume junk food, encourage them to uh, play out and not uh, sit in front of the television or in front of laptops or in front of uh, iPads, which we see so uh, commonly. We have to uh, intervene at that level at the age when, the, when they're very small, children are small uh, through adolescence. So we will prevent the emergence of risk factors, which is primordial prevention, which plays a very important role in the ultimate incidence and prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fatma. Indeed, something extremely important. Um, the data that you have mentioned about 54% of the population, that same study, it said that 28.6% of the population of Pakistan is hypertensive, and uh, 28 of which male than 28% are females. And over there, they also especially pointed out that smoking is one of our major problems maker especially in males, if it is number one or number two over there. But that's where the story doesn't end. The story actually sort of begins because it also says that nearly seven, and for the ladies, it's at number seven. So smoking becomes the reason to become hypertensive and you keep on smoking and this keeps on worsening. So it becomes a vicious cash 22 syndrome. But it seems that you will be extremely again be pleased to see that uh, your talk has been very well been received because now we have questions coming up that people want to be trained in preventive mm -hmm. cardiology and they want to know how and where can we uh, do this preventive training. And number two, what is your take on the role of a doctor in influencing the patients to be careful about and to go for the prevention? I think uh, preventive cardiology as such, um, I mean, you both, uh, well, uh, all three of you uh, over here may correct me that as such, it's not uh, established as a department somewhere in Pakistan yet. But of course, um, we had uh, initial interaction with uh, Zubair to start this program either as an MD degree program or as an FCPS cardiology program. And uh, of course, there have been some, uh, say, uh, debate on that where should we park it, that whether the cardiologist after getting a um, cardiology training, he goes for a preventive cardiology training further or an internist to it or a um, uh, public. So, so there is uh, some, some debate going on that. But generally speaking, uh, if you talk of a primary prevention, no, that probably has to be the domain of family physician first, the, the most likely person to start with. And then, of course, the second person would be the, the internist or uh, where, uh, I mean, uh, the primary care physician, I would, instead of saying that, the, the primary care physician is the one who knows the families and he, he knows uh, that uh, what is happening to their and how he's following them. 
uh, as far as uh, getting it as a specialty uh, i think uh, in near future we'll be having uh, the training program where curriculum is being uh, devised and it is being uh, set uh, fcps uh, in uh, pre preventive cardiology is probably on the board zubair sir might correct me that uh, is it is it probably on <coughs> board right now thank you thank you tarik sir extremely important uh, issue so this, uh, this is being uh, taken up uh, professor aziz sir you very kindly talked about the 35 inches and the 40 inches issue <laughs> and uh, people are asking a, even a better question now they are saying what is the role of cosmetic surgery in ascvd prevention yes. and they are talking of the both and i like to shed on both on the lights of the bariatric surgeries also and the role of cosmetic surgery does cosmetic surgery make any difference it does definitely a lot of difference but not in medical sense <laughs> <laughs> well i think um, let's first make sure that cosmetic surgery is not medical surgery it is purely for to improve your looks and it has got no medical benefit all right but i am wondering if bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery can be used to prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease it should certainly do so because we have known that bariatric surgery whatever there are two major types one is a sleeve gastrectomy the other one is rue and y bypass procedure both are major surgeries they are expensive surgeries and they carry lot of risk but they are very rewarding and worldwide certain criteria have been defined you have to have bmi of 40 or more you you have to be super obese or you have to have bmi of 35 with multiple risk factors and you must have tried simpler measures first so if nothing works and you have a lot of money and you can go for bariatric surgery it should definitely reform thank, thank you sir so extremely something which is becoming a fashion and a fad that everyone wants to get uh, thin then but i say that professor aziz sahab is of the opinion that you should get your thighs slimmed if you want and your waist but that won't make as far as any difference because it's not going to remove any fat from your organs Actually, where it has i just more well and it has been seen that those who are pre diabetic or early diabetic those patients who are on anti diabetic medication those who are on lipid lowering drugs they have actually then there there is no need after bariatric surgery so it is so effective but that effect tends to wear off up to some time thank you sir um abdul bhai sir so much discussion so much point about calcium scoring the big <laughs> question aspirin should one take it just like that just because you have turned 50 should you take aspirin because you are 55 and you are not a diabetic diabetics yes we have evidence a lot of people are taking aspirin and a lot of physicians and family physicians are saying okay you have turned 55 and your grandfather had heart disease so you must take aspirin what is your take on that before that i just like to have a little experience uh, quite a bit of my patients are on uh, uh, bariatric surgery <clears throat> and i'm following them and i've seen uh, probably they are eating less after um, uh, that surgery uh, uh, their lipids are actually going down and their requirement for statins is going down and i think their blood sugar levels are also nicely controlled for how long i don't know because i'm not following them for last one or two years but it needs a update we have we don't have enough data what will happen to their metabolic status yes. that's very really coming to aspirin i think uh, as far as the calcium scoring is concerned uh, in a patient in intermediate risk group not for low risk group not for high risk group so intermediate we are plus minus should we give statin to the, this patient should we not give statin to this patient so i think um, in these patients lipid lowering drugs are very important lipid lowering aspirin i think is is controversial as far as the primary prevention is concerned because until and unless we establish that there is a plaque of suppose and uh, i was just checked the carotid and there's a plaque on the on the in the carotid in the primary prevention uh, assessment 
and that cloth is very soft with irregular margin i would definitely put them on aspirin and statin right and then a patient who has a, 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 a ankle brachial index 0.9 definitely so wherever there is plaque definitely it goes because the plaque rupture inflammation you have to give anti inflammatory and anti platelet together Thank so you. Then there has to be a plaque before you start okay. aspirin yes. um sir a lot of this ldl cholesterol has been discussed as well sir and uh, people are always talking about it and we also know that the hdl cholesterol is the one which is referred to as the good cholesterol the one which actually takes the things bad better to you and we also know that it is a lot of genetic basis behind it and we have seen people with some very good uh, hdls also and we also know that what is your take on the fact that if someone has got an hdl of 40 45 or less than that and you want this hdl to go up because the ldls are extremely high or whatever the reason may be my basic question there by actually is focusing on what measures that you can take to take your hdl high sir uh, thank you bilal obviously uh, uh, that's one of the biggest risk factor for south east asians you know and uh, you know very studies have been done you know in even uk population of the the uk population of pakistani and indian descent and they have found one of the major risk factors for ischemic heart disease in that population is low hdl you have talked about a very good level you know 40 to 45% uh, milligram person but obviously most of the uh, southeast asians at uh, you know most of the patients which we see the target has to be above 40 and uh, most of the people which we see the hdl level is ranging even normal or even the patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is about 30 to 35 and uh, many of the patients even have got hdl levels less than 30 so this is itself a very important independent risk factor you know that's a friendly cholesterol and uh, first the reason is a genetic predisposition which as south uh, east asians or whatsoever we have that a uh, genetic tendency for a low hdl but obviously to uh, increase the level of hdl nothing better than exercise what about nicotinic obviously, acid would like to talk about nicotinic acid over here yep obviously first thing has to be exercise you have to lose your weight and you know brisk walk that's the best ex- uh, thing to raise your hdl cholesterol and obviously if uh, still not raise you know uh, statins you know they have got uh, even the, the all sorts of statins they have got some role in bringing some increase in hdl but not a remarkable role Ni- right. niacin is the drug you know which can increase hdl but obviously it has got a lot of side effects like hot flushes etc and it's not very well tolerated in mo- most of the individuals so the best thing is reduce your weight sedentary lifestyle should go and lot of exercise and walk that's the best way to increase your hdl thank you sir sir and as we are now approaching sort of you just ask one more two more minutes to go i just like to put up a question which especially come up from the audience and that is directed especially towards dr fatma uh, mukhtar over here that what about clinical research well, how can we actually build it up we lack clinical research in this country what is the preventive methods that we can do by uh, clinical research you mean uh, clinical trials or research generally or research generally and you know what needs needs to be done in order to get enroll people how should any clinical trials be generated regarding the ASPD and the society's problems at large so when you talk about uh, clinical trials clinical trials is a type of uh, research uh, which uh, helps evaluate the effectiveness of a particular uh, drug a new treatment it could be a new surgical procedure it could be a new radiological uh, um, uh, intervention or even uh, in the case especially in the case of uh, uh, ascvd uh, uh, a community trial which can be a preventive trial in which uh, like the examples of uh, the stanford 3 uh, community trial mm-hmm. 
the MRFIT trial, you can choose uh, two or three communities and uh, uh, two communities can be the intervention. This, this I'm talking about a preventive trial. Two communities uh, can be the intervention community, one can be the control community, and you can uh, provide the intervention, be it uh, healthy uh, nutrition, be it a particular uh, physical uh, form of physical activity, and you can uh, compare it with uh, the control community and see the effects over a period of time. This is a preventive uh, trial. However, the classical clinical trials or the uh, uh, that are carried on uh, in the hospital setting uh, and the gold standard is the RCT or the uh, randomized control trial. If uh, it is to be conducted, if suppose there's a new uh, drug against uh, hypertension that has come in the market, then uh, you can uh, uh, enroll eligible uh, subjects who are who volunteer to participate in your study. Then they are randomized into uh, group A, which is uh, the group uh, we can call it the intervention arm also in which the new drug is given and you can have a control group in which uh, some other existing antihypertensive drug is given and both groups, the intervention and the control group are uh, then followed forward in time to see uh, the effect uh, and uh, where till when they have to be followed, what effect has to be seen will be determined by the uh, principal investigator or the principal uh, researcher. So these are uh, what we call as experimental studies in which we have uh, the uh, randomized control trials, which can be therapeutic trials and they can be uh, preventive trials. However, if we talk about research in general, uh, we can have uh, uh, descriptive research and we have analytical research. Uh, the classical example of our descriptive uh, research is your uh, cross-sectional studies, which uh, look at the uh, frequency of disease and uh, identify uh, the uh, distribution of disease uh, in terms of uh, person, place and time. Um, then we have the, uh, uh, the analytical studies in which you have your observational studies and your experimental studies. The classical example of your observational studies are your case control and cohort studies, which try to identify uh, the risk factors of a particular disease. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Fatma. Extremely kind of you to shed light on this uh, important issue regarding the trials that need to be carried out and how we have. Now, the clock ticks and the time finishes. So today's ASCVD is sort of coming to an end. But please remember one thing. The way I have many times discussed it with our patients, you may become a diabetic. You may become a hypertensive. You just need to make sure that you get your math figures and your numbers corrected. You may unfortunately also have hyperlipidemia and hypertrichosidemia and all of those hypers, etc. You have medications and the form of exercise. That exercise, which is a win-win situation to control the lipids, control the diabetes, and control the hypertension. But out of the four major risk factors, it is your tobacco consumption, which you go out there in the market, buy the poison for yourself, and then wonder what happens. The preventive risk factor scoring says smoking per se. It does not say how many cigarettes you're going to be talking about. Even if you're having one cigarette a month, a cigar or something like that, tobacco consumption of any form, you are at risk. And if you do your risk calculator and you do it once with the smoking and then do it again without the smoking and you'll see the big benefit that it comes out of it. So please, as a physician, family physician, you have to enforce into your patients that yes, this is the most, the strongest addiction on God's earth today because it is so unfortunately socially acceptable. But the only way that we can make a difference to our society is by finishing it off. The government doesn't collect enough taxes from smoking. You end up paying more from your pocket and the country spends more on the treatment. Prevention is the name of the game. Cure centers, hospitals, etc. can be many. But it is your desire, it is your choice to lead a good and healthy life. Go to an age of 80, 85 when you can go ahead and do skydiving. That is the place when you say that I have led a good and a healthy life. Be there for yourself, for your family, for your grandchildren, and for your great-grandchildren. 
that is the only way it becomes a great great nation and then i would like to specially thank atco pharmaceuticals who have made this great partnership with the pakistan society of internal medicine and has brought out this whole great whole form to us especially thank for the basic fact that you have given us an uninterrupted and unlimiting academic grant which has made things very good my special thanks to mr kashif who unfortunately because of his strong family reasons was not with us today but we uh, pray hard for his the his family's recovery from covid business as is the the national game these days of going around i thank mr vakas hashmi for his kind support that he has been giving us and the troubles that we have been going on and not to forget my good and dear friend akhtar tahir for his all the time the various issues that we were have been bothering them out my special thanks to the society's president um javed akram saab for giving us a free hand in getting out and reaching out to the family physicians and my special thanks to all the 270 or 300 odd family physicians who have joined us uh, with this uh, scientific uh, event for us if you make a difference in the life of even one person that make a difference so tomorrow is the day when we lead our life in a better way yes cbd here is time for you to go and leave us alone thank you and by the way at the end of this uh, whole meeting you will have a self assessment test come up go through it learn about it you will have four days to respond to it once it has all been done then we will display it for you uh, the answer the right answers this is not a test kind of a thing this is for you to learn and improve yourself all the best pakistan zindabad